It was pretty cool. <laughs> Sears. Uh, all right, we really should get to work. Um, why don't you get your compasses out? Maybe I should have seen how many raised their hands when he asked how many didn't like math. Um, not the north-south stuff either, compasses, no? All right, you know that this is a math talk. Let's make believe. Take your make believe compasses out, draw a circle with a radius of eight miles. <laughs> Within that circle, there are 100,000 children, most of whom struggle every day just to get the kinds of educational and lifetime opportunities that other kids get as a matter of course. Most of these kids are missing a parent. Many of them are missing both. Most of these kids live in neighborhoods that are impacted by crime and violence in a significant way. Kids go to their corner store to get a container of milk and they will put their money through three inches of glass. They will put their money through three inches of glass and the reason for the glass can walk in behind them at any time or follow a little girl home. And when they go to school, they walk through metal detectors and they think this is normal. They think this is what it is. And of all kids, of all kids, it's these kids in our city that are given the worst school system in the country by any measure. In 1992, we created uh, the Math Corps to try to do something about this to help in a small way. The Math Corps serves middle school and high school kids in Detroit. It features summer camps, Saturday programs, and a very strong mentoring component where our high school kids uh, serve as big brothers and big sisters for our little kids, and college students serve as big brothers and big sisters for the high school kids and the little kids. The kids come back year to year, so there's a very strong um, sense of family in the math corps, and a culture has grown up. Uh, this past summer, uh, one of our kids lost his mom, and uh, he has no father, so his uncle offered to take him to New York, and uh, he would live with his uncle in New York. Well, the way he explained it to us and to uh, our family meeting of 200 kids, so we have a rather large family in the math corps, the way he explained it to the 200 kids was, why would I want to leave my family to go stay with my relatives? Um, the results of the program have been dramatic. Um, over 90% of our kids graduate high school. Uh, that's compared to the Detroit result, which is whatever, the statistics are kind of all over the place, but they're all bad. Um, we're running an ACT average of 21.6 as compared to 16. But, you guys got bad timing. <laughs> because now I'm going to say, but we've got to do more. We've got to do more. Um, and in truth, you know, when, when things go bad, you know, your family, your friends, you know, they tend to say the common thing, you know, Steve, come on. If you can just make a difference in the life of one child, one child, that's something really special. That's something you can feel good about. After 20 years, I don't feel good about one kid. There's thinking 100,000 kids in the city. How do you feel good about one kid? So we need to change the school system. We need to change our city. We have a greater dream now of math core academies, schools, across the city. Spreading the math core culture, spreading its philosophy. We do teach math, um, and we actually have a, a revolutionary new curriculum that we, we believe is, is actually the cure for arithmetic and algebra um, across the country, but that's, that's a different talk. 
Um, this talk, I'd like to talk about the philosophy of the math core, because that's, that's its essence. And philosophy um, pretty much consists of two parts. And the first part is easy. You got to care. You got to care. That's all. You got to care. And you got to love up every kid that comes to you, and you got to love them with a passion and an urgency. And then number two, you got to believe in them. Now, our belief is, a, is, is actually quite specific and very powerful. It's not just that you got to believe in them. Our core belief is that every child that comes to us has a special greatness within them, a greatness within them, not an okayness. Not every kid can learn math, every kid can pass math. That's, you know, that's garbage. We're talking greatness. A few months ago, um, I found out that a young woman passed away, and it hit me hard. I was cut up pretty bad. I never knew her. Some years ago, I was at a wedding. And before the ceremony started, I was just looking around the room, and I noticed this young girl who was incredibly, incredibly overweight with a really terrible facial disfigurement. And all I could think about in my shallow way, not knowing her, not wanting to know her, all I could think about was pity. And all I could think about was stuff like, God, you know, I feel so bad for her. She'll never, she'll never go out on a date. She'll never have a boyfriend. Those were the things I thought. And in the middle of the ceremony, the minister says, and now we're going to have the singing of Ave Maria. And she gets up. And I will tell you that it was the most beautiful experience I've ever had. And I sat there, my shallow self, in tears. And I have never forgotten that girl. She had greatness in her. She had greatness in her. Whether I could see it or not, she had greatness in her. So when we see a kid who can't add one plus one, we now see a kid who will be a future mathematician. When we see a kid who beats the crap out of some other kid, we see a beautiful, sweet child who just did a really bad thing. There are no bad kids in the math core, only beautiful, sweet kids, good kids who do bad things sometimes, like us. There's a problem with believing in kids. It makes you crazy. <laughs> Your program starts to break all kinds of rules. It flies in the face of conventional wisdom. And you become a total whack job. <laughs> so you're forced into things like high expectations and rigorous demands because you believe in your kids. I mean high expectations. So for us, our kids got to be there every day. They got to be on time. Nobody walks into a math class late. Don't tell me better late than never. That's for the rest of the world. For us, no. You don't walk in late. Homework every night. And if you don't give us enough homework, we'll flunk you. So we have failed kids who have gotten 99s on their final exam. 99s on their final exam. 99 averages in the course. Flunk them. Didn't give us enough homework. We play hardball. On day one, on day one, I say to the kids, and I, I speak to them the way any kind of program director would, guys, um, here's what we need. Well, on day one, what I'll say to them is, you know, in most programs, most people ask for respect. Most people will say, we need you to respect one another. We need you to respect us as teachers. I'm not going to ask for your respect. That's like breezing. That's given. Of course you're going to respect me. I'm going to respect you. You're going to respect each other. That's obvious. What I'm going to ask in the math core is something much more. I'm going to ask that you care about one another. Not that you respect each other. That you care about each other in a serious way. And we challenge kids. And we don't avoid problems. We attack problems. So two kids sitting in a classroom, talking, 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 
the standard procedure is you separate them. You go sit there, you go sit there. Well, you avoid the problem. With us, they're going to sit together until they show us their greatness. And we believe they will. 200 kids walking out of State Hall, our classroom building on Wayne State's campus. 200 kids going to lunch. We can take them out the back entrance. Take them out the back way. Move 200 kids out that way, that's easy. We don't ever do that. We march them past as many classrooms as we can. Filled with Wayne State College students who never know that 200 kids just passed by. The fairness doctrine. Most people will tell you that fairness means you treat everybody equally. We reject that doctrine. In the math core, we treat everybody differently. Everybody's different. We substitute our own fairness doctrine. Our fairness doctrine is that you don't treat everybody equally. You care about everybody equally. You care about every child equally. And you treat them the way they need to be treated, in their own way. Be yourself. It's probably one of the most powerful messages we impart to our kids. Be yourself, because if you have greatness in you, be yourself. So what does it mean? It means that we've got tough guys who finally get to smile and cry. When you walk into the math court, there's a sign that says, welcome to the math court. Please remove your mask. No uniforms, be yourself. So unlike many other schools and programs, no uniforms, be yourself. Express yourself. Be an individual. It's beautiful. Wear a hat. This guy's wearing a hat. That guy right there is wearing a hat. Our kids wear hats. A girl came to me this summer, and she said, Professor Khan, I'm being picked on. Kids are picking on me because of my looks, because I'm not very pretty. And I had to think, what do I say to this girl? She was no Halle Berry. <laughs> so what I said to her was, you know, you know Halle Berry. <laughs> and I'm no Brad Pitt. But you know what we are? We're good enough. We're good enough. And I think the, what it comes down to is that we're all beautiful in some way or some ways. We're all beautiful in some ways. And in all the other ways, we're good enough. And if you think about what that means, what does that mean? I think what that means is we're all good enough to be loved by someone. We're all good enough to be loved by someone. And we're all good enough to love. Now here's the really crazy thing. I mean the really crazy thing. Now we're going to go off the deep end. If you really, really, really believe in kids, you end up talking to them about really, really, really important things. Middle school and high school kids, and you get to talk to them about changing their city an army of beautiful children <clears throat> taking beautiful values out to a city, taking a beautiful philosophy of caring about one another out to a city, and maybe out to a country. If you want to get real crazy. And here's the wild thing, they listen. They listen. My father, my father owned a little store in Brooklyn, New York for 45 years. When he died in 1990, the president of the Gerritsen Beach Neighborhood Association called up my mother and said, Mrs. Khan, we are so sorry for your loss, but we would like to honor Jack and you and your boys with a parade down Gerritsen Avenue. A parade down Gerritsen Avenue. My father sold socks. My father sold socks. 
But my mother and me and my brother rode in an open-top convertible down Garrison Avenue with people on the streets having signs saying, we miss you, Jack. Thank you, Jack. My father sold socks, but he had greatness within him. And the really wild thing is, so do we all. My father moved an entire neighborhood of Brooklyn, New York. We might be able to move a city. And if we do, they just might throw a parade for us. <laughs>